the the film uh, addresses you know the subject of toxic masculinity to a, a, a certain extent and small engine repair how did it initially come about the idea the opportunity i guess is the word to take it to the screen and and also i guess was it always a definite thing that you wanted to direct it because obviously you've written it you star in it and you're directing it and this is your feature debut as a director was right. there a point where you were like that seems like an awful lot to be taking on or did you feel so familiar with your your material that you were like I'd be a, a freaking nightmare if I had someone else directing me in, in in this I mean I think if it came down to it I would have directed it as opposed to be in it but just to back up so John Bernthal, who has become not only a dear friend, but like a real creative collaborator and a bunch of stuff. So we sort of met in that. And we were always like, we could, we should make this new movie. We should do it. It was always like something we always chatted about. I mean, he was instrumental in moving it to New York. And, you know, he and I have a whole, you know, Jesus, like a dozen projects going on at this point. But this was always one that we were like, I mean, there was a time I was like, let's fucking co-direct it. Yeah. Um, and we were all we're so fluid he and I in terms of our collaboration that like that could have worked but it became you know more and more of a reality not only as his career took off and as I got more and then things just started to click it had stops and starts over the years and then it kind of happened at well not really the right time in terms of a fucking pandemic but in terms of thematically and, and how it places itself in a contemporary moment it worked out but you know look it's easier to do an indie movie that's predominantly one location. There's all that stuff. Uh, you know, it's an acting uh, uh, piece. So it was all that stuff that I was like, I knew played to my, to my strengths. And I mean, quite frankly, to roll the dice and take a risk, I was like, I don't know when I'll have this opportunity again. Let me just kind of go all in on it. And having played the character so much and being, you know, sitting at it, I, I just kind of knew it. And, and to be honest, I felt as my first time directing, I'm like to be in it, to be like sort of the, the thermometer in the bathwater while directing. I was like, it, it all just kind of clicked. The whole apparatus of the filmmaking was designed around this very unique situation and opportunity in terms of what it was. So I was terrified by it, but I was always like, well, fuck it. If I'm going to roll the dice, I might as well, you know, go all in. You know what I mean? Like, when are you ever going to get this opportunity again? I mean, yeah, I, it, sound, it sounds like the right thing to do. I, I will say at this stage, I was going to sort of explain uh, a little about the story of the film myself, but I think actually because there's, a, there's some big stuff that happens in it, and I, I don't want to blunder into spoiler territory here and end up, you know, ruining sure. uh, a, 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 a huge turning point uh, in the movie. So I thought I, I'd let you <laughs> give us an idea of, of what... Uh, small engine repair is about and then I, I then i have some questions about how it might have changed from what it was in 2011 absolutely so you know it's a the movie uh is you know it's about these three childhood friends who are sort of bonded over their love for uh my character's teenage daughter who they were kind of helped raise <laughs> in this sort of rougher working class neighborhood and you know it's about sort of as as she reaches a point where she's becoming a woman things get more complicated and then they're all kind of put to this sort of test of of their friendship and their love and and uh you know it's it's it, it enters some really tense territory and because these are look these are not like you know accountants these are guys who are quick to get into a fight and they're rough so they're already living on the sort of a, 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 a that level you know that physical sort of visceral level and uh but to me it's like it's like a family drama with like super dark comedy in it with it with like a very sort of biting social commentary to it that's sort of how I, I looked at it and and you know a character piece an actor's piece but to me it's about this sort of very highly unconventional family and and just dealing with some you know issues that I was always I'm always trying to work out and I wanted to reflect them in all their messiness and I mean, like, I don't think it's a spoiler to, to say the, the, the film uh, addresses, you know, the subject of toxic masculinity to a, a, a certain extent. And I mean, I think people's awareness and society's awareness in the last 10 years about this uh, and about the issues around this and about it being a problem. I, I think that's changed. I think people are more aware now 
then possibly they were in 2011. And so right. in that respect, has have did you have to look back at what you'd written and go, okay, well, some of this is going to have to change because it, it is, it's now more uh, commonplace or at least more in the, at the front forefront of people's minds than it, it was when I first wrote it. I, I mean, I definitely agree with that. But to me, it was always like, like I don't think this particular class of guys has been examined very often with such sort of raw honesty. Mm. And I think a lot more of the country is like this than is reflected in pop culture. Certainly in theater, I haven't, hadn't seen a lot of, you know, working class New Englander type that aesthetic. Um, you know, I think toxic masculinity has, has become a lot more uh, of a common used word. I mean, it's not like it was running through my head. I just said, I wanna be honest about this, about the conflict mm -hmm. and about the pitfalls and the, and the ugliness, as well as the beauty of this camaraderie. And, you know, art, uh, drama and art is conflict. So inevitably that's going to go there. <laughs> um, you know, I, I felt with the Me Too movement coming out, uh, it was a great opportunity to really look at the material through that lens and, and see what's going on, that sort of reckoning, which, the, you know, the play has always sort of dealt with that. I have grown up around a lot of women, as I said, and, and, and you know, I, listen, I was no stranger uh, to hearing and experiencing, you know, that point of view my whole life and, and kind of felt like having a foot in both worlds, both having a very open communication with really strong women who had had difficult situations in their life, but then also being like grown up in an environment where it was very, you know, difficult to express emotions and do that and, and be more of a tough guy. So I, I kind of like felt in between those two worlds. And that was those collision is is ultimately what the play was about. But then when Me Too came out, I was like, oh, wow, here's an opportunity. Not Me Too came out, but you know what I mean? Mm. When we started to have more awareness of that, it's like how to add to that conversation in a different way and how to harness what's working in the play and contemporize it. And, and, and the biggest transition from the play to the movie was the inclusion of these female characters who are very strong and as flawed and as, as sort of vibrant as, as anybody else. And, and having that breathe that life and have that, that statement, which, you know, again, when I say I made what I felt is like a hyper-masculine, unfiltered material for women, because this is my movie that says I've been listening to you, you know, my whole life. And here's a point of view of it. That's not uh, a fairy tale. It's like showing the complexity of these situations of, you know, of all of these myths that we hear of, you know, the, the, the father with a shotgun thing, the, you know, the, the taken, the, the Liam Neeson revenge, you know, subverting that as well as, you know, what, what, how much of, of misogyny is in, is in humiliation and all of this stuff and really kind of packing it in there and, and mm -hmm. putting these images and these ideas there that like, I know the women in my life who would be like, oh, okay, at least I hope is that, I'm understanding that through through this very unconventional cast of characters and talk about. It. I mean, the whole thing is really revolving around all of these men, and it's all dictated by their relationship with women and, and sort of the and, and instead of toxic masculinity, I would almost say like sort of the 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 the, the masculine and the feminine inside of each one of us, and whichever one is sort of dominating at any given moment and 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 that like constant struggle of, of where it is. But like, I thought with the Me Too movement, it was like, finally, oh, wow, um, we have to listen to women. <laughs> you know, wow, this is what it is. And it's like, well, shit, they've been saying this all along if you've been listening, so to speak. Uh, anyway, that, that was sort of, as, as, I mean, even talking about it, it's so emotional and complicated that I just felt the only way to really address that was to create an emotional and complicated and provocative uh, situations. Basically. It's, a, it, 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 it's really it's it's such it's a great film by the way i don't know if i've said that yet i i, I really loved it and i, no, I found it... maybe i did sorry so much. <laughs> hello alex here thank you for watching this video i hope you enjoyed it if you want to get in touch with us at all for any reason you can find us on twitter and instagram at jtf pod and don't forget to subscribe to the full audio podcast on apple spotify or wherever you get your pods